que eu falasse em inglês. Eu posso... O que, que eu faço? Inglês? É mais chique. <laughs> ok, he's the boss. Ok, okay so uh, today I want to discuss these very old and elementary results uh, about the local uniformization theorem. I mentioned to you uh, during the first uh, class that there is a theorem of Gauss which is really a wonderful theorem which says that if you take any surface let's say in free space but that's not important and if you pick a point on that surface it is always possible to find a small neighborhood of this point and a map from the surface to the Euclidean plane, which is conformal. So any surface is locally, conformally equivalent to the Euclidean plane. Phi is conformal. So I remind you that conformal means that the differential of phi at any point is uh, preserving the angles, okay? That's the theorem Gauss proved. He proved it in the real analytic category. So he assumed the surface is real analytic. Actually, he did not mention that because for him it was obvious that everything was analytic. So he made no, no assumption. He was take, taking any surface you will see that his proof is using analytic and of course most of you know that this theorem has been much improved during the 20th century going to analytic uh, surface to smooth surfaces even to measurable uh, version of it which is the so-called measurable Riemann mapping theorem that I told you has nothing to do with Riemann Okay? But today, and since I want to stick to historical ideas, I will try to explain to you this theorem in the way Gauss was thinking. And I will give you three proofs of that, which will be identical. I will prove three times the same theorem in different language, and the third version will be the actual version presented by Gauss. But since it's, hard, it's rather hard to read at first, I want to express it first in a language that is understood, I think, by uh, modern mathematicians. So let me give you a first proof. Proof one actually will not prove the theorem, but prove another theorem. And the other theorem is much, much easier to prove and uh, almost trivial. It is the following thing. Instead of taking a surface in three space, and hence, instead of looking at the Riemannian metric in dimension two, I will deal with pseudo-Riemannian metric. So consider, let's say, in an open set U in the plane, consider a pseudo-Riemannian metric. Pseudo-Riemannian metric. So it's something like a usual like a dx squared plus 2b dx dy plus c dy squared, exactly like a Riemannian metric, except that for a Riemannian metric, we assume that this is positive definite. Here, I will assume that the signature is plus minus. So it is like a Riemannian metric, except that the length of a, of a vector is not assumed to be positive, it's positive and negative. So the standard example that we might call the flat pseudo-Riemannian metric is the metric dx squared minus dy squared. And the theorem of Gauss in this category 
and you will see it's kind of trivial theorem, is the same. Theorem is this. Any pseudo Riemannian metric in dimension two is locally conformally equivalent to the metric dx squared minus dy squared. So it's exactly the same theorem. If you give me a pseudo Riemannian metric, signature plus minus, it's always possible to find a local coordinate that makes it conformal to the flat pseudo Riemannian metric dx squared minus dy squared. Proof, two lines. Look, what is a pseudo Riemannian metric? I told you, it's something like that. It's at each point you have a quadratic form, and this quadratic form is not supposed to be positive definite. It's plus minus. Hence, at each point, you have two directions on which the metric vanishes. So on this open set U, you have at each point two directions, giving the directions where the <laughs> I should not go there. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> okay, so at each point you have these two directions on which the metric vanishes. And these two directions, of course, give you two foliations in the open set. Two isotropic foliations. This is for the metric you are looking at, G. Now look at the metric dx squared minus dy squared. What are, the met what are the directions where this vanishes? Well, you have dx is square is equal to dy squared. So dx is equal to plus or minus dy squared. So in the special case of the flat metric, these two foliations are just like that. Now, the theorem of Gauss is obvious. You pick any point. You map it to any point. You look locally at, at the leaf of the first foliation emanating from this point. You map it the way you want to the corresponding leaf. You look at the other leaf going through this point. You map it to the other leaf here by any diffeomorphism. And then you're done. You pick any point close enough to the original point. You look at each leaf where it is, where the two leaves starting from this point cut the yellow and the orange. And you draw the corresponding picture here. And you define phi of x by mapping this point to this point. In other words, you choose the image of two leaves in any way, and you complete the picture by requiring that the map is sending foliations to foliations. And this is obvious to do. Once you have that, what can you say of the pullback or the, the push forward of the metric by this diffeomorphism? After this transformation, the new metric, phi star of g, has been changed in such a way that, by definition, its isotropic directions are just the same as the isotropic directions of dx squared minus dy squared. Hence, this field of quadratic forms has the same isotropic directions as dx squared minus dy squared, so it has to be multiple. So this has to be of the form let me put it this way. So this means that after this change of coordinate, the metric 
is given conformally flat. Okay, so this is a very simple idea. In order to find a local conformal map, in this case a pseudo Riemannian metric, it is enough to send the isotropic foliations to the isotropic foliations. Okay? End of proof. Now, of course, the theorem of, uh, of, of, of Gauss is not dealing with pseudo Riemannian metrics. It is dealing with metrics. So how can we uh, play the same game when the metric is definite positive? So there's no more isotropic directions anymore. So the trick of, uh, of, uh, of Gauss is, and this is truly remarkable because at the time the concept of complex numbers were not so, it, was, it did exist, but it was not very geometric. And people were not used to using uh, uh, complexification and think of complex numbers are, are geometric objects. Anyway, what, uh, what Gauss did is exactly the same, except that you have to complexify the situation. So here's the proof that number two say, now you have a Riemannian metric And you assume that A, B, and C, which are functions of X and Y, are real analytic. By definition, a real analytic function is just a function defined on an open set of R, or, or R2, which extends as a holomorphic function of a small neighborhood of this real part in the complex domain. So I can decide that X I can decide that X and Y are now complex numbers. And that my neighborhood U was actually the intersection of a complex neighborhood of the of zero in C2. So you think of an open set in C2 now, and you have, for each point in this open set in C2, you have a complex quadratic form. It's not a Hermitian quadratic form, it's a complex quadratic form. dx, dy, and dz are now thought as complex numbers. And now you draw the same picture, except that you have to, you did more imagination. You draw the picture of you, see, like that, and you say, well, given any point in this open set in C2, I have two lines on which this quadratic form is zero, except that these two lines are now complex lines. But this picture is now the picture of two complex lines in C2. So I do have now two foliations, and the only difference with the previous case is that this is not two foliations, two real foliations in the real domain, but here you have two complex foliations, holomorphic foliations in the complex domain. So here you have the same picture as before. So what you can do is you can send that to, by the same idea, you want to send it to dx squared plus dy squared is equal to zero, which now consists of two foliations, which are now not anymore the dx is equal to dy and dx is equal to minus dy, by dx is equal to i dy, d i dx, when you have these two, so this is dy is equal to plus or minus i dx. You have the same picture. 
except that, again, this is a picture in C2, and this line here is a complex imaginary line. And I can do the same trick. I send any point to any point. I send the first leaf to the leaf through this point. I send the second leaf to the leaf okay and then I, I this defines completely a map you pick a point here you look at the two leaves through it you look where they meet the purple and the green one you look at the image of the purple and the green one, and you complete the square. This is phi of x, y. The only problem is that there is no reason to believe that this map from here to here is a real map, is a complex holomorphic map from C2 to C2, from an open set of C2 to an open set of C2, which is mapping the isotropic directions of the Riemannian metric to the isotropic directions of the flat metric. But this map has no reason to be, to be a real map. How to make it real? Well, if you have a holomorphic function from an open set of C2 to an open set of C2, what does that mean to be real? It just means to commute with conjugacy. So on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side, you have a nice involution. X, Y goes to conjugate of X, conjugate of Y. And the same is true here. For a map to be a real map, it is necessary and sufficient to commute with this involution. So now, if I want to construct a map, which is a real map from R2 to R2, which is my goal, I just have to make this construction invariant under conjugacy. So that's very easy. You pick your point, but now you choose your point as a real point. You choose its image, well, you choose it as a real point, like for example, zero, zero. You look at the purple, uh, the purple um, leaf through it, you map it to the purple leaf through it the way you want. And now you have no more choice because the involution here will map this purple leaf to this green leaf. So any point on the green point, on the green leaf, is the conjugate of some point on the purple leaf. I already defined the map on the purple leaf so there is, I have no more choice for the image of this point because I force conjugacy. So I have no choice. I define the map on the green leaf by being the conjugate of the map which was defined on the purple leaf. And once I did that, the construction is fully symmetric under the involution x, y goes to y, x bar, y bar, y bar. And then you get a map from an open set of C2 to an open set of C2 commuting with the involution and hence is a real map. And this real map is of course conformal because its differential at each point is preserving the isotropic directions of the complexification. Okay, so this is the proof, this is exactly the proof of Gauss expressed in modern terminology. So let me tell you how Gauss, Gauss is writing the proof. The proof of Gauss is really two lines. In this, two lines, not more. Uh, he does in the following way. Oops. Sorry. So 
So when I was a student, I was taught always to do this, but I never... I'm not able to do that. Okay. So here's the way Gauss is writing. Again, I spent uh, 15 minutes explaining that. I'm sure that Gauss would have been surprised that I spent such a long time on something which is so easy. So Gauss is writing this way. He was writing the metric. So this is the Gauss proof. He writes the metric this way. A dx square plus 2b dx dy plus c d y squared. So this is the way he writes. He writes that. And then he says, uh, let us do like we do in, uh, in high school. I mean, you write this uh, polynomial of second degree as a product of two factors of the first degree. So you have to help me <laughs> something like um, something like that. Is it okay? Uh, yeah, I think it's... Uh, Uh, no, because not, not four, because I, this is the reduced discriminant. Okay? Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, he writes that. And then you have, um, uh, this is, let me write it this way. You see, this first part is a differential form in x and y. It's a one form in two variables. And this is just the conjugate. Oh, there must be an i. Yeah. Yes, by definition. Okay. And of course, what uh, 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 Gauss knows is that if you have a differential equation in the plane, uh, you have this uh, uh, flow box theorem, as we say today. Uh, in the old tra terminology, people said that the differential form in two variables always locally has an integrating factor. If you multiply it by a function, it becomes exact. So Gauss says, well, but this is 1 over A times... Um, f d g times f d g bar, where f and g are functions. Okay. And then, this is 1 over a, f f bar, d g d g bar. And we are done because the function g is conformal. The function g maps, uh, uh, how can I say that? g is a map from R2 to, uh, how can I say that? Uh, If you write g as u plus i v, this is f f bar a d u plus d v squared. What? D u squared. squared plus d v squared. Which means that the map from R2 to R2 given by u v is a conformal map. You made it flat up to a factor. 
Is that okay? That's, so that's even longer than what's happening in the paper of Gauss. Okay? And you have to uh, note that this is not, for Gauss, it's, it's, it's not something abstract. It's not an existence theorem. It's something you can compute the uniformization from that. And uh, in the time of, as I told you, uh, Gauss was in charge of producing a map, a map of uh, uh, northern kingdom of uh, Germany or Denmark, I forgot. And uh, so he really had a, 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 a country, a given country, on a given shape, the shape of the earth. And the earth at the time was not supposed anymore to be a sphere, it was an ellipsoid. And then you have the precise problem, find this F, find this G, when the surface you are dealing with is an ellipsoid. And then you have a wonderful uh, computation to do. You are given an ellipsoid, and you have to find the F and find the G. And this is what uh, Gauss does. And the end of the paper of Gauss is a huge formula, really a huge formula, to uh, uh, write down the conformal representation of the ellipsoid on the plane. And again, the formula is not easy. And then he makes numerical computation with big digits and uh, he makes explicit. I mean, this is a, a remarkable mixture of uh, pure and really applied mathematics. It's going to the end. It's going to the computation. Okay, so this is the proof of, uh, of Gauss. I told you I don't want to go to the modern facts. I mean, you know, this theorem has been generalized to smooth category, to measurable category, but I don't want to discuss that. Uh, uh, I just want to, 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 to go further. Now, I want to discuss something very related, which has been proved in 1856 by Chebyshev. So since I speak in English, it should be Che B Chef. So in French, it's Che B Chef. In Portuguese, is okay. Anyway, the important thing is that we should not make the mistake that everybody does, that I did. It's not Che B Chef. It's Che B Che B Chef. Okay. The second one is a Che, and the first one is a Che. Chebi Chef. It's not the same letter in Russian. Okay. Okay. So uh, in 1856, Chebi Chef wrote two papers on uh, cartography uh, in French. Actually, it's called uh, Sur les cartes de géographie. And he solved the following problem. Suppose you are given, let's say a round sphere, the Earth, and suppose I give you a country, X, on the Earth, I will assume it's really uh, uh, bounded by some smooth Jordan curve, and I want to map it conformally to the plane, I want to make a map of it. By Gauss, we know that at least if the country is small enough, that is possible to do it conformally. And the question of uh, Chebyshev is, what is the best way to do it? What is the best map, conformal map, of a given country? So you have to define the word, the word best. Of course, if the map is conformal, at each point x in x, you can, you can look at derivative, phi prime x. And since it's conformal, it's really, it's a homotetic. So this is, you can compute this as a, it's a number. It gives you the scale at point x of the map. What you would like to get 
is this function as constant as possible. So you will take this supremum of this, divided by the infimum of this, and let me call that the defect of the map. If it is as close as possible to one, if it were one, we would be happy, the map would be an isometry. If it's as close as possible to one, it is the closer the better. And the theorem of Chebyshev is this. There is a unique map I will explain that this is unique in a moment, which minimizes this quantity. This defect. Yes. Which function? Phi prime of x. Phi, phi is a conformal map from the country to the plane. So at each point in the country, there is some dilation. The differential of phi is a homotopy. And this quantity depends on the point. Okay? So you take the maximum, you take the minimum, and you take the ratio of the two. No, no, I took the supremum. It's a function of the map. So I don't understand what you don't understand. Phi prime. Phi prime at x. Oh, it, it doesn't. It's conformal. It's conformal. It's a number. Okay. When you have a conformal map from an open set in the on the sphere, let's say, to an open set in the plane, since it's conformal at each point, the derivative is multiplication by a number. Okay, and I'm looking at the size of this number. Okay? Okay, 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 okay. Okay, <laughs> okay. okay. so uh, the theorem says there is a unique conformal map which minimizes this defect. And again, since at the time, these great mathematicians were not only pure mathematicians, they want to find it. And he tells us what is this best map and he tells us how to construct it. And this unique map, this unique map is characterized by the property that the dilation phi prime x on the boundary is constant. Is constant on the boundary of x. So if you pick a conformal map at random, it will map you the country x to an open set in the plane. The map, the dilation phi prime x is a function on the country x. And there is no reason to believe that on the boundary of x, this dilation is constant. So the theorem says that there is a unique one having constant dilation on the boundary. And this unique one is the best you can do. OK? When I said unique, I put quotes here because it's not unique, of course. If you have a map, you can post-compose it by some homotopy by changing the scale. If you post-compose it with a homotopy, it is clear that this supremum will be multiplied by the modulus of A. This infimum will be multiplied also by the modulus of A, so this ratio is not modified. I mean, just changing scales on the map. Okay? So when I said unique, I mean unique up to similarity. Since the similarity is just a change of the unit 
are on the map, the scale on the map. Okay, so let me prove that. And then this, I will show you that this characterization is good enough to construct the best map. And as, as far as I understand, uh, uh, I saw a talk by Feigenbaum, maybe 15 years ago or something. And Feigenbaum was, um, uh, after his period in dynamics, he was going to, to cartography. He gave a talk on cartography in the um, 60th birthday of Douadi. And uh, what I remember is that in this talk, he just re rediscovered that without mentioning it anyway. So uh, anyway, he claims that, uh, which is probably true, that cartographers uh, today are just uh, full of tradition. This is a traditional job. And a good cartographer basically is improving the quality of the maps of his father. And so if you look at the, you know, these atlases, you see very nice maps which are just little by little improving the previous ones. And what uh, um, Feigenbaum was claiming is that it, was, it would be good to, to forget about the history of cartography and start it again. And using this theorem, you could get better maps, very uh, 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 much more precise maps than are available today. I will discuss that in a moment uh, uh, when I discuss uh, something uh, uh, later, later. I mean, this has also a practical uh, importance. Okay, so let me uh, prove that. Well, if I have a map phi from x to the plane and another one is psi from x to the plane, I want to compare the, their dilations, I mean their scales. So let me define, uh, in, instead of, let me put, put uh, let's say f of x is log phi prime of x. And let me put g of x to be log psi prime of x. And what do I want to prove? Let me, okay, let me assume that f restricted to the boundary of x is constant. So dilation is constant on the boundary. And I want to prove that this implies that the supremum of G minus the infimum of G is more than the supremum of F minus the infimum of F. Does everybody agree that this is what I have to prove? I have to I want to prove that the map I want to prove that the map phi is the best map. So I take another one, and I prove that this other one is not as good. To be not as good means that the defect is greater or equal to. The defect is here a quotient. Since I took a log, it's a difference. So the defect is essentially the difference between the sup of g and the inf of g. So I want to prove that the sup of g is minus the inf of g is greater than or equal to the sup of f minus the inf of f. Okay? Under the assumption that f is constant on the boundary. Now you have the following lemma. that basically I will not prove now, but this is not true. Lemma, which is that these functions f and g are not any functions. 
their Laplacians are equal to 1. So F and G are functions defined on an open set in the sphere. What I claim, and this I will say a few words about that later, I claim that these functions on the sphere have a Laplacian equal to 1. Assume that for a moment. Okay, so corollary. The difference between the two is a harmonic function because both have Laplacian 1. Okay. Corollary. F minus G achieves maximum and minimum on the boundary. Like any harmonic function, it takes a maximum and minimum value on the boundary. Second corollary. Uh, let me assume, I assume F is constant on the boundary. Let's assume for simplicity that this constant is zero. This is not a problem by rescaling. Hmm? Um, since the Laplacian of F is one, well, this means that the function is uh, uh, superharmonic or superharmonic? Yes? Super or sub? Sub. Sub. Subharmonic. Yes, subharmonic. Which means that since it is zero on the boundary, it is non positive everywhere. Okay? So F, restricted to X, is non positive. And that should be enough to prove that. Let us try. Well, 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 let me call uh, C the supremum of G on X. Now, let me write this. F minus G, the supremum of F minus G is achieved. Let me put it this down. G minus F. The supremum of this quantity, since it's a harmonic function, is achieved on the boundary. So this supremum is something like G of xi minus F of xi for some xi on the boundary of x. But on the boundary of x, F is 0. So this is G of xi. So this is less than C, because C is the maximum of G. Well. So this inequality sup of g minus f less than c means that for every x, g of x minus f of x is less than c, which means that g of x is less than f of x plus c, which means that the infimum of g is less than the infimum of f plus c supremum of G. But then I can, I can add here the supremum of F since the supremum of F is zero. And this inequality is exactly what I wanted. Okay? So just playing games with the positivity of uh, harmonic functions and uh, you know, maximum principle, you get immediately this, uh, this condition. So this shows that if there is a map, conformal map, for which the boundary has constant distortion, then this map is optimal. Now, is there a map like that? Well, let me prove it. 
existence of this optimal map, well, uh, there is still this lemma. Uh, I will skip it, I think. Existence of the map is this. constant such that phi of prime of x is constant on the boundary of x. Look, it's not very difficult. You take your sphere, you take your country x, and you take a conformal map Sorry. Maybe the, the dilation is not constant on the boundary. So you want to fix that. Well, you will compose this psi with some holomorphic function. Uh, let's say uh, theta. And you will define psi phi by this commutative diagram. So you want to choose the theta in such a way that after this uh, post-composition, the new dilation became constant. But how do I compute the dilation of psi composed with theta? Well, by the chain rule. Okay, so what I can say is that the uh, psi prime at x is psi, is, phi, is psi prime at x times theta prime at phi x. Okay? So if I put a log here, I get uh, uh, f of x is uh, g of x plus log theta prime of phi of x. And what I want is zero dilation here. I want to choose correctly the theta in such a way that after this correction, the new dilation is constant on the boundary. I want this on, uh, on the boundary. Okay. Okay, but now you see here what I have is the log of the modulus of the derivative of a holomorphic map. The log of the modulus of the derivative of a holomorphic map is a harmonic function. So this formula, if you restrict it to the boundary, you get zero is equal to g when x belongs to the boundary. You see, this on the boundary, I know this harmonic function. This harmonic function on the boundary is given by gx, and gx is given. And now you have this Dirichlet principle, I will discuss that more precisely in the next uh, lesson, which tells you that if you have a continuous function on the boundary of a domain, you can extend it holomorphically in the inside of the domain. Harmonically. You can extend it harmonically inside the domain. So whatever continuous function you give me on the, on, the, on, the do, on the boundary of the domain, you can complete it by a harmonic function. Here, this is exactly the situation. We have a function which is minus gx. This function, you think of it as a function on the boundary of my domain, and you extend it holomorphically, uh, harmonically, inside the domain. And this harmonic extension gives you the theta that, that fixes the situation. So again, this, if you are able to solve the directly problem, and you know uh, it's easy to do on any computer, 
you can easily find the best map of a given country. And in the paper of, uh, of Chebyshev, he has no computer, but he makes computation for the uh, best uh, map of, uh, for some reason, he looks at the portion, some specific portion of Russia. Uh, uh, I don't understand that. He's very, he's very much interested by maybe half, half of Russia for some reason. Anyway, so he makes a computation. He gives an idea of the best conformal map you can get from Russia to the to the to the to the uh, to the plane. Okay. Now I want to uh, finish this by some other problem, which is. Uh, uh, let's say a conjecture. Uh, this is, um, I like to say, it's Milner's conjecture. You know, people say, well, Milner's conjecture is about the complicated things in uh, K theory or uh, homology or Lie groups made discrete or things nobody understands. But there is a conjecture of Milner that he made in 1963, I think. Uh, which I will explain to you is uh, still open today, and really this is one. Of, this is the only conjecture of Milner we can explain easily. It's, uh, Milner wrote a paper called "On the Problem of Cartography," 62. Uh, I forgot, 62, 63, something like that. This is a very nice paper. As, as many papers of Milner, but uh, uh, the good point of this paper is not only it is nice, but it is, it is uh, dealing with elementary mathematics. So it's uh, just a pure pleasure to read it. So uh, what Milner does is this. He says, uh, why should we look at conformal maps for constructing maps? So he says, uh, here's a, the sphere, and you take a country, X, and you want to construct a map from X to the plane, and you would like this map to be as good as possible. But he says, why should we look at conformal maps? Maybe we can find non-conformal maps which are better than conformal maps. So we have to define what is better. So here's the definition. If you pick two points, X and Y, in the domain, you want to compute the distance between phi of X and phi of Y. Distance computed, let's say, in the Euclidean plane, U, divided by the distance between X and Y computed in the sphere. And you would like this to be as constant as possible without requiring conformality. So what you did do is you take the supremum of that, all pairs of points, you take the minimum of that, And you call that the defect of the map. Oh, sorry. If you want something which is, put a log in front of it to, to make it more beautiful. So the defect of a perfect map will be zero. Okay? You want this to be as close as possible from one. So the log will be as close as possible from zero. So let me give you a theorem for this paper. Uh, theorems and uh, conjectures. Uh, theorem one is this.
it's more an exercise. It says uh, for every country X, there is at least a map which minimizes the defect. This is a good exercise for first year topology course. It's an exercise on Ascoli theory. You take a sequence of maps going down to the infimum of the possible defects, and you want to, e to extract from it a converging sequence of maps, and you prove that the limiting map is indeed uh, how reaches the best defect. And this is, uh, uh, I promise, it's uh, S. Ascoli. It's not Milner, it's Ascoli. Yeah. Ascoli theorem makes it easy. Now, already conjecture. Assume, for example, the easiest you can do, assume X is some convex country, convex and small country. I don't know which country in the world is convex, but uh, is there one? I don't know. So, uh, question, is this phi unique? Is this Phi, minimize, this phi minimizing unique. Of course, unique as before, up to similarity. Is it a diffeomorphism? I think it's a good question. It's by definition, it's a Lipschitz map. Because, you know, by definition, maps like that are Lipschitz. So it's differentiable almost everywhere. But should we, should we expect smoothness for this minimization problem? You know, people do, doing uh, minimization they don't like minimizing supremums. They like minimizing uh, rounder norms, like L2 norms or whatever. So this, this is open. But Milner proves a theorem. He solved this question in a specific case. He solved the problem when the country is just a disk. So here's the theorem. You take the sphere, let's say the pole, North Pole, and you take a disk around it, and you assume, say, the angle here is alpha. So you really look at the polar uh, calot. What's the English word for that? Polar cap, cap, cap. Polar cap. Okay. So you look for a polar cap of angle alpha. And the question is, what is the best map for that? And the theorem of Milner says there is one. It's unique, and I'm going to show it to you. So the, uh, the best map for such a disk D alpha is unique and is, somebody has a guess? No guess? So, no, no, it's, it's not the conformal map. So, uh, the, in cartography, his, it has a name. It's called uh, azimuthal, pro, uh, or azimuthal projection. In mathematics, it has another name. It's called exponential map. So, if you take the exponential map from the tangent plane to the north, this is tangent plane to north pole, you take here <clears throat> uh, 
you take the exponential map from the tangent plane to the sphere. So every point in the tangent plane is mapped to the sphere along geodesics at the same distance. This exponential map will map a disk with radius alpha to the, to the polar cap. Okay? Am I clear? What? Alpha is given. So, alpha is given. Now, you take the exponential map, it maps a disk in the tangent plane to a polar cap. So, the theorem of Milner is that the best map to the polar cap is the inverse of that. Okay? So, is the inverse of the exponential map. Now let me give you the defect of this map. Well, it's, not, it, it, it's clear at least that along the geodesics, along the uh, longitudes emanating from the North Pole, this map is an isometry by definition. Now if you look at the circle here of radius alpha, its perimeter is 2 pi alpha. But the perimeter on the Earth is 2 pi sine alpha. Okay? So there is distortion. In particular, you can see it's not conformal. In the direction of the longitudes, is an isometry. In the direction of the, of the meridians, it's uh, contracting. So the defect of this map is log, or at least it's reasonable to think that the defect of this map is log alpha sine alpha. Okay? Now, uh, for small values of alpha, For small values of alpha, uh, where did I put my, my, my bag? Yeah. Uh, there is an uh, expression for it. I forgot. For small values of alpha, it's uh, as for small, this defect is about alpha squared divided by 6, which is about 2 thirds of the area of the disk divided by the area of the sphere. If you, by the way, I cannot resist. I mean, how do you compute the area of the polar cap? How does one compute the area of a cap on the sphere. Does somebody know? Yes. But do you know the result? Archimedes. This is the one wonderful theorem of Archimedes. Archimedes? Archimedes? What's the name of the Archimedes? What's the name of the Greek mathematician? 
Archimedes, okay. Here's the theorem. You take a sphere, you put it in a cylinder, sphere is S, cylinder is C, and you project radially the sphere to the cylinder. So every point on the sphere, you project it radially to the cylinder. This is a map from the sphere to the cylinder. And the theorem is that this map is area preserving. This is a theory more than 2,000 years old. Okay, for example, if you want to compute the full area of the, of the sphere, well, you just have to compute the area of the cylinder. The perimeter is 2 pi r, and the height is 2r, so it's 4 pi r squared. It's good. Okay? So if you want to compute the area of any area on the Earth, just project it radially to the cylinder, and you get the correct answer. So if you want to compute the area of a disk, well, you just have to compute the area of a sub-cylinder, which is very easy to do. Okay? Okay, so uh, this is why, I mean, okay, anyway. Now, for the, uh, what is the defect of the stereographic projection? Because you could say, well, let me compare this map to the stereographic projection. The stereographic projection is conformal, and what is its defect? Well, you compute, and you get the following result. The defect of the stereographic projection, stereographic projection of the disk D alpha, turns out to be equal to two times log of one over cosine of alpha over two, which is alpha two over two. So the Milner's map, the exponential map, is three times better than the um, stereographic projection. Okay, now uh, let me go for our next conjecture. This is Mindorf's conjecture. Conjecture. Suppose your country X is convex. Suppose its area is equal to the area of some disk D alpha. In other words, choose alpha such that D alpha has the same area. Then there should exist a map phi from x to the plane whose defect is less than log In other words, according to Milner, the disk should be the worst possible case. Any country, convex country, should be mapped, mappable to the plane with a defect which is not bigger than the defect in the case of a round disk. So that's the conjecture, and there is a sub-conjecture, uh, weaker than that. And the sub-conjecture, uh, using this uh, kind of, uh, is that for any x, for any convex s, convex x, there should exist a map, easier to remember, whose defect is at most the area of the country relative to the area of the Earth.
And uh, Min Nong is an example that I like very much. This is the example of the United States of America. It's a big country, we all know that, but how big is it? What is the percentage of the Earth covered by continental USA? Do you know? 1.5%. I think very interesting to know that, you know. 1% of the Earth has so much power, huh? So, uh, there should exist, there should exist a map of the USA with defect 1.5%. And according to Milner, the best known map is 3%. So, uh, and we should not look for conformal map because the best conformal map is, as we have seen, is really not as good as these uh, non-conformal maps. Okay, so, um, I have seen uh, a few days ago uh, some kind of uh, theorem by uh, two people uh, Bonk and Lung, going into that direction. Let me mention it. Here's a theorem of Bonk and Lung. The theorem is this. Theorem. Bonk. Long, I think it's 2003. You take a Riemannian metric. In the plane. Which is complete. And such that the amount of positive curvature is less than 2 pi. Uh, I think that's it. Then the theorem says then there exists a bi Lipschitz map Phi from the surface uh, uh, yeah, from the surface to the Euclidean plane which is Lipschitz both ways with a Lipschitz constant in both ways less than square root of this. So you have here a square root. Below you have 2 pi minus the total amount of positive curvature and above you have 2 pi minus the total amount of negative curvature. So you see in order this to, for this to make sense that the total amount of, curve of positive curvature should be not more than 2 pi which is exactly the total amount of curvature on a half sphere. So if you take a convex domain in the, in the sphere it will be sitting inside some hemisphere with total amount of curvature less than 2 pi. Anyway, so this is a theorem that goes in the direction of Milner because it tells you that if you have some information of the total amount of curvature on a given surface that enables you to produce a Lipschitz map to the Euclidean plane with a bound on the Lipschitz constant given by the total amount of curvature which is exactly in the spirit of uh, uh, Milner's conjecture. You are given a country on the Earth, and you want to map it to the plane. 
and you would like to control the Lipschitz constant by a function of its area. And the area is essentially the integral of curvature. Anyway, so um, I'm in front of a, of a choice now. Uh, uh, I had in mind proving these theorems of Milner, but I cannot do that in, in 10 minutes. Um, uh, uh, I have two possibilities. Either next time I skip this proof, or, uh, or I do it next time. Okay. Should I stop now? Or, or because uh, you mentioned to me that I should, I should, I should stop before noon. Yes. It's good to stop now? Yeah. Okay? Okay, so I stop now. So next time, I will probably begin by uh, proving these theorems of, of, of Milner that uh, indeed the uh, exponential map is the best possible map of a disk. And then I will go on. We are going uh, discussing conformal representations of simply connected domains in the plane. We look for the proof of Riemann, which was wrong. We will try to see how it was fixed by Hilbert much later. And I will try to explain to you how Schwartz tried hard to understand Riemann's theorem in simple polygonal cases. OK, thank you. Oh, I should say uh, tomorrow, yeah. So, yeah. Next time is tomorrow, because last week, uh, there was this uh, Peixoto meeting. So uh, uh, next class will be tomorrow at the same time, same. but not the same room. Uh, Which one? Not clear? The symmetric one? OK. What? <laughs> Complex conjugate. <laughs> Assuming the real, well, where is the real line at impa? <laughs> OK. Thank you.